Okay. Uh, good afternoon, Mr. Mata. My name is Samuel Lee, and I am going to be interviewing you for the Houston Asian American Archive. Uh, today is October 17th, 2023. And to begin this interview, could you briefly introduce yourself with your full name and when and where you were born? Yeah, my name is Abraham Madhab. Um, back when I was born, Southeast Asia, especially South, you know, India, Pakistan, and Burma were all considered kind of one and the same. So my birth certificate says uh, Pakistan, but my family moved me there very quickly. So I consider myself born in Burma um, from age zero to age nine. Um, and then when their nationalization happened there, we moved to what is now Bangladesh, and then we moved to Pakistan two years each, and then I moved to France for a little bit. Then I came to the U.S. at age 14. Wow, that is a lot. Um, I guess we can start with a little bit about your family. Do you mind kind of sharing what your family life was like when you were growing up um, before the age of 14, I guess? Yeah, uh, the Burma, we... In, I lived in Rangoon, Burma for the first nine years of my life. We lived in the shadows of Shwedagom Pagoda, which I'm pretty proud of, um, which is a, a pagoda that's very important to the Burmese Buddhists. And I lived in a community that I had a mosque uh, right down the street, a synagogue. I went to Catholic schools and there was a Buddhist temple across the street and um, there was a lot of Chinese and Indians. So it was a very eclectic, um, experience not just at school but living in that community um, so and we were fairly well off um, so it was a different life than what I have now which I guess you'll get into later um, uh, like I said I went to Catholic schools and then the nationalization came where they came in and took everything we had and we lived under that for about a year um, you know you go from going to school you know, having chauffeur driven cars to where you have to walk or ride the bus, which is a big change for a seven year old. So we were there for a couple of years and then we moved to Bangladesh, which was even worse. Because um, Burmese society was a very open society um, before the nationalization. So my mom and my sisters were able to come and go and do what they needed. When we got to Bangladesh, we had to live with a, um, or rented a house in a, in a family compound which is very strange. And then my mom and my sisters couldn't go out. So as a nine-year-old, I wind up doing all the chores, shopping, banking, because my father and my older brother went to a different city to try to make a living. So we were there to, for two years until the Bangladesh, now known as Bangladesh, were trying to break away from Pakistan. The East, they were named East Pakistan at the time. And again, my brother was almost killed because we didn't fit in um, to the Bangladeshi culture or not culture, but the racial, social background that they wanted. So we left there to went to Pakistan for two years. And that, that was kind of a little stabilizing for two years, but then they had the war with India going on. So my older brother and two sisters moved to the United States, whereas I wound up going to France because I wanted to live in Germany with my uncle, but it didn't happen. So I wound up coming here. Um, just to kind of let you know, I had already at that point I had already graduated from high school, and I had about a year of college. So coming here to the states at age 14, and going to college with no help, basically, was a tough. So I understand about a lot of the students what they go through when they come in as foreign students. I don't know if that's all what you wanted. Yeah, that was. And, a lot. and the same thing goes for you. If I'm kind of going sideways from what you want to know just stop me and ask no yeah of course thank you for sharing that 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 is a lot um you said you were in college by the time you were 14 then yeah I, I was pretty sick when I was a kid so I learned to read and I used to kind of raid the American consulate and the British consulate whatever country we were in to grab books and read um, so I, you know part of reading allowed me to bypass or jump grades so like their system is um, three kindergartens, KG1, KG2, three, and 10th grades. This was a Franciscan, um, no, the, there's a order out of Canada that the school systems were in all of those countries. So I wound up in staying the same school system. There you, could, you had to um, test out of the current grade, even from kindergarten, 
and then you test into the next grade. If you can do that, you go to the next grade, but uh, unfortunately, unfortunately, I ended up testing better than most people, so they would just skip me. So like, I never attended K2, K3. I went from K1 to first grade for a couple of months, and then I went to the second grade, then I jumped to fourth, and I was in fifth for a whole year, and then I went to seventh, then ninth and 10th. And also in their system, you test out from the school, and then you would have to test out as in the country's uh, testing system. So it, it's, you know, people think when I say I graduated early, they think it's easy. It's harder than, like, say, my younger sister who went to American schools. You know, I, I get to compare that plus my children. And I think it's, you know, you, you know, if you went to Chinese school or if you're familiar with it, they're much tougher than anything we have in America. Wow. So and in Pakistan, Pakistan, I went one year of college when I came here at, at age 14. So the school system you just described, this was in Burma or Bangladesh? Yeah, yeah, it was in Burma and Bangladesh and Pakistan and partially in um in France, but I didn't go to school in France, but it's run by um, a group of monks called Brothers uh, from Canada. They run schools like that all over Southeast Asia and Asia. Uh, okay, I see. And just for bookkeeping purposes, you were in, so you were born in Pakistan, but immediately moved to Burma and spent nine years there, correct? Correct. And then correct. two years in Bangladesh? Right. And then two years in France? In Pakistan. Oh, in Pakistan. And then how long in France? But but nine months. Okay. And um, could you share a little bit about how your family was kind of spread out? Because I know you mentioned you had an uncle in Germany. Did you have any other family members outside of your immediate family that lived in any of these countries? What? Yeah, during nationalization, um, General Ne Win had tried to nationalize the country and kick out everybody that he considered not um, Burmese nationals, even though my family had been there forever, mm -hmm. um, to almost 200 years. Um, so when that happened, a lot of my father's side of the family moved to uh, either Los Angeles, Culver City, some moved to Europe, some moved and some stayed. Um, if you uh, just kind of an anecdotal story, uh, one of my nieces, as I call her, she's my cousin's daughter. When she got married in the early 80s, mid 80s, uh, we were, you know, my cousin had rented out a whole hotel floor in Long Beach. And sitting on the bright side, we had black people, people that look like you, people like my mother who had red hair and green eyes and Chinese uh, looking people, you know, Asian looking people. and 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 I was married at the time to an Anglo, and the waiter asked, I said, man, the bright side of family, you guys have a lot of friends from all over the world. I said, no, they're not friends, they're all family, they're first and second cousins. Mm -hmm. uh, so that was kind of interesting to him where she had married a guy from Pakistan, was marrying a guy from Pakistan, and his group looked all homogenized, you know, just they all look packy. Um, so that's kind of my family history to kind of give you a background. My father's side of the family was called Chinamada in our in the language that we spoke Gujarati, which means Chinese Madha. Mm -hmm. um, and my son, just about ten years ago or so, he met 12, thirteen years ago or so, when he married a Chinese woman, her last name was Jenny Ma, and my last name is Madha, M A D H A. And he had never believed me when I said we were part Chinese, we were part African, um, depending on whose side of the family it was, and he was. He got a, one of those uh, DNA tests done and he came back and goes, oh my God, you know, I married my cousin. I said, well, don't worry about it. She's about 700 years difference between okay. when the family went to China and became Ma. <laughs> so he was worried that he might have married a blood relative. So that was kind of funny. Wow. So a very, very diverse family, huh? Yeah. And, and just one other anecdote and then I'll let you get back to your question is my... Uh, census when i took the 2010 census in america uh, you know i'd just been um taken off active duty and i was in the reserves at the time on an inactive status and feeling kind of frisky i, I said place of birth as earth and uh, race as human so the 
the people in the census bureau didn't think it was funny so they tried to get me in jail for lying huh. and i had to explain to the judges like you know coming from the background that i do and having lived in so many countries plus when i joined the military they send me right back out to southeast asia um and during vietnam i caught the tail end of the vietnam war mm -hmm. and so she started laughing and told the people that there's really nothing wrong with my answers so that's why now a lot of us put human in place of birth as earth which is true i mean you know i wasn't lying it's the truth yeah that's funny that kind of tells you yeah that's when han chi asked me to do this interview i had to think about it and i said yeah you know my granddaughters are half chinese and um they they need to know you know where their background is if my son doesn't tell them mm. yeah, i should be able to give them some background are you so, I first, so how would you yeah. identify yourself ethnically then i don't you know that's the funny part about it is that's why i had a little bit of thinking to do when it says you know it's for asian americans like well, well you know i did grow up in asia and i did i was born there um ethnically i still classify myself as human because i have so many cultural um backgrounds you know plus racial and blood types and all that involved with me um to where and that's what i claim and that's what i push the idea that we're all one human race and we can claim to be from somewhere geographically but that does not make who we are right. the young lady you just saw is she's from central america i adopted her uh, as a single parent a few years back and so i have to teach her that you know she's she's very violently like me now to where she won't identify as anything except a human and place of birth as earth so and yeah. I, I wish more and more people thought that way that would release some of this aggravation that we have on this planet mm -hmm. i see i really I like mean, if you looked at me i mean right now i don't have hair much hair left and in the video i look like i'm bald but i'm not i have you know, <laughs> um, i used to have red hair with green eyes and i spoke chinese <laughs> so that was kind of funny when i first came here yeah so. So maybe moving away from the ethnicity, then how would you kind of define yourself culturally? I'm sure like um, you experienced a lot of different sociocultural influences growing up then. Yeah. Yeah. It's, you know, I, I tell people and I, and I have a block that I'm that got taken away for a little bit, but I'm going to put it back up is culturally, you know, I live close to Chinatown in Houston. Um, I live in a very diverse, eclectic neighborhood. So especially in Houston, there's so many cultures and ethnicities and stuff. And people are, you know, it's a human nature to try to claim a tribal aff affiliation. I don't. And some, and when I got single, I started dating. That was one of the hardest things for my potential dates to get their head wrapped around because they wanted to pigeonhole me into one. I said, look, my son did a DNA test and he didn't believe me that I was North African. I'm 50% I'm North African by blood, but my family was in Asia for a long time. Um, and, you know, he obviously on his side, he is Anglo and German, his mother is, and he had to come to terms that he has Chinese blood in him. He has Asian blood in him, Southeast Asian also, plus he has North African blood. Mm -hmm. So one of the things I've, grown up telling them is to not think of themselves geographically limited or ethnically related, just be who they are. And if you have studied Zen or Taoism, that's what it's all about, is who you are and your actions. And yesterday I was very lucky for Jesse, my daughter here that you just saw, um, to meet the Buddhist monks from Tibet. But they follow the Tibetan um, line of buddhism but they they live in india and they're traveling around the world and she, she was able to hear you know about self how do you identify and it all made sense to her what i've been telling her is the self is who you are but it's not your body it's it's your mind and your actions and that's what i preach and you know mentor a lot of young kids you know, your age group and a little bit younger uh, about seeing things that way and not get tied to tribalism i don't know if that makes sense no that makes perfect sense and i think that's a really important viewpoint that a lot more people should be conscious of in today's time um 
Yeah, and especially around Houston. Right, it's such a diverse city. Um, I guess that yeah, that's mm -hmm. one, one one question you haven't asked that I'll interject real quick, and I'll let you get on the sticks is um, is religious. You know, one of the things religion is part of a cultural thing, and people are amazed that I can attend a synagogue, I can attend a mosque, I take Jesse to the Chinese Baptist Church in Houston. And they all accept us. It's kind of funny. They're the only ones that accept us more than anybody else, um, mm -hmm. the Chinese Baptists. And I have a bunch of friends that I eat lunches with called Romeo, which is retired old man eating out. <laughs> there are 45 to 50 Chinese people and me. And <laughs> people will ask them, you know, why is this guy? I say, well, he's Chinese. You don't know that? And, you know, they look at me it's like, you don't look Chinese. But I'm, and they accept me. So I I'm, I'm feel pretty uh, blessed that, the, the group accepts me and, and welcomes me so yeah that's amazing um and that's really sweet I think um that actually kind of leads me to a question I had um maybe more so like when you were growing up then how did you kind of navigate these different cultures and belief systems like religion you just kind of mentioned did you grow up believing a certain way that your parents taught you well, my parents were pretty easygoing as far as religion goes. And like I said, we were surrounded by places of worship of every kind. And I was also blessed that the person, because I was sick until my ninth birthday when we left Burma, I was brought up by a Buddhist monk um, because he was you know, in Burma. You're allowed to be a young person, go to the monastery for two years, and then you decide whether you're going to continue to be a monk or go back to the the life you know the everyday life of of uh, what's the word I'm looking for here secular life right mm -hmm. and he happened to be the guy that drove drove me and my mom around he was our chauffeur but I got to spend a lot of time with him even at his home and so I learned the concepts of Buddhism which has really been and and Taoism which has really been copied in the Abrahamic religion being named Abraham it was kind of interesting. And one of the things I tell people that, you know, my grandmother was Jewish. She was married to a Muslim guy on my mom's side. And they got along fine. They, but they were kicked out of Middle East, North Africa. And they settled in Burma, uh, you know, long before I was born. And on my father's side, there were just so many cultures, ethnicity or bloodlines that were in there. Um, I was able to go by desserts. I call it my dessert philosophy. Whoever had the best desserts for the holidays is who I was that particular week. <laughs> you know, it's like the, during Diwali, I was Hindu because I could go have all the desserts during Muslim Eid or Ramadan. I was Muslim because I could go eat all the food that I wanted. So that was kind of funny. To, to, to Food was the common denominator for me is whoever invited me to go. And because I was kind of sickly and I wasn't age appropriate in school, I had to find friends elsewhere. Does that make sense? Yeah, yeah. So where where did you find most of your friends or who did you spend most of your time with growing up? Um, the first nine years, because I was pretty sickly, I didn't have many friends. Plus the last two years we were in Burma after nationalization, um, I was put into night school. Um, so, you know, even my neighborhood friends weren't available to me because they went to either private schools or public schools during daytime. And I went to the, the Catholic school at nighttime because that's the only way we could keep in the system was to take the night classes. So I really, you know, was, uh, you know, if you watch Big Bang Theory, I was kind of like the kid, Sheldon as a kid, mm -hmm. um, to where I had to find friends elsewhere in books and, you know, adults. So when I joined the service, eventually at age 17, I was the youngest one and everybody in my group was anywhere from 20 till you know, 50 wow. when we're in there. So that's, so I, I tend, now that I'm 67, it's kind of funny to where um, I find friends that are older and younger. I mean, like I said, I mentor a lot of young men and women that are much younger, and then I'm friends with people older, but I find I don't belong um, ethnically or culturally or anything elsewhere. I think the Romeo group, which is the Chinese Baptist church, people, retired old men eating out, and Han Chi, the guy that introduced me to, to your group. Um, but it, it's not a friend thing. It's more of an acquaintance thing. 
the closest friend I would probably have would be a lot of my military people. Mm. So I'm not answering your question, but I did answer it that I really didn't have that many friends growing up. Because one, my classmates were much older than I, and I was kind of an anomaly to them. Um, plus culturally, I thought differently than they did. So like when you're in Bangladesh, you know, 90% of the classmates were Bengali, um, and we didn't belong with them. And and it was a Catholic school, so, you know, there were some foreigners there. So that was the same thing in Pakistan. That was the same thing. Burma was the only one that I could have had made friends, but I was also not age appropriate because by the time I was in second grade, I was seven years old, I think, and everybody else was, you know, 10 and 12. So it's, you know how kids are. Yeah. Young Sheldon, huh? <laughs> So I don't know if I'm giving you too much data or not enough data. Let me know. No, no, I really liked everything that you know you're sharing right now. Um, I guess firstly, a... yeah, I've got a book I'm writing called "The Human from Outer Space." That's how I feel. Oh, really? You're an author too. Yeah. Wow, you wear many different. I don't hats. write under my name, so. Oh. No, I, you know, yeah, it's not wearing different hat. I, I believe that. I don't know if you've ever read Robert Heinlein. Um, he wrote the book Dune and a few other things. He has a treatise that's called Human Being, where he goes through what a human being should be able to do. It says specializations for insects. Mm -hmm. And you're a neuroscientist, so some of the things you guys study is how the brain works, and people just specialize and let the rest of the brain die out. Yeah. And you consider yourself a generalist? Yeah, um, I, I was talking, I volunteered at the Bayou City Arts Festival with my daughter and young lady she's mentoring from Afghanistan. And there was a young Hispanic guy that was working. Um, and because both of them are beautiful, he was trying to get on my good side so he could get to their phone numbers. But, you know, I was telling him the same thing that I told you just now. And I said, you know, so he came up with a saying that I like even better, which is like, you know, uh, somebody's a jack of all trades, but a master of none, but it's better to be a jack of all trades and be master of none than to be a master of one and not understand the rest of the world. Right, right. Yeah. Um, I guess this is also a tangent, but what what was your sickness exactly when you were growing up? I forgot to ask earlier. What, what repeat the question, please? You said you were pretty sickly, so uh, did you have a specific yeah. illness? No, you know what it was? It was kind of sad because both my parents and that age group smoked a lot. And uh, I'm deathly allergic to cigarettes. So they they took me through and get all tested and they thought I had an immunodeficiency disease or something like that. And then I figured it out at age eight or nine that it was their smoking that was causing that. So when we moved to Bangladesh, my father wasn't there anymore because he was living someplace else. I mean, he'd come to visit. So my exposure to cigarettes got a lot less and my mother wasn't smoking. So I got better. And you know, one of the things that led to my life here in the U.S. is that I have to stay away from smoking and a lot of people that you know, might you know, be exposing me to those irritants. Right. So. And um, how about your siblings? How many siblings did you have? And um, how is your relationship with them? And did any of them have the similar problem with smoking as you did? No, um, I'm the only one that had the breathing issues and the smoking allergies. So I have three sisters who are still alive. Uh, one brother who's passed away. Um, one of the things, one of the enigma that's Abraham me is that all three sisters have nothing in common with me when you ask for the relationship. My brother and I had a lot more in common. He had joined the Air Force a couple of years before I did. And, you know, we got along fine. We had no issues. And he passed away with colon cancer about 20 years ago. Um, but my sisters uh, have um, developed into their own world of um, their prejudices or whatever. So what I wind up doing, I have five siblings, as I call my sisters, that I chose them as my sisters. Um, uh, so... Three of them were with the air military that I've, I met. Uh, one's a black lady, a uh, woman that lives in South Carolina. We just came back from visiting her. Another one is, um, I'm very proud of, lives in San Antonio. And then another one that lives in Baltimore with her husband. 
Um, so the two first two were single, the other one is uh, married. Uh, all three of them have known me for at least 30 years. Uh, I consider them more my sisters. Uh, one is a Lebanese, the lady in San Antonio's sister is Lebanese. The one in, in South Carolina, like I said, is black. And then one is um, Arlene is Anglo, I'm married to a very good man. And I have two other ladies that I've kind of adopted over the years. One is a Russian uh, Jew who lives in Boston. Now she used to be in Houston. And then Bev who lives in uh, Seattle, Tacoma with her husband. Mm -hmm. um, so those five are more my sisters than my biological ones. I see. Do you still see them around though? Your biological sisters? Well, the youngest one and I are never going to talk again because she has pulled too many um, the blind tricks and other things. The oldest one and I talk sometimes, she lives in San Antonio also with her husband, um, who's the Bangladeshi. And the, the middle one is the one I probably talk the most, but uh, she is an ultra religious Muslim. So one is ultra religious Christian, one is ultra religious Muslim. And the other one kind of just pretends to get along. Uh, and me being an agnostic, you know, like I'm not an atheist because I, I, I'm not arrogant enough to think I know the answers. I'm agnostic. I just don't care about organized religion. I care about how they treat me. Mm -hmm. um, so the five women that I call my sisters, none of one of them is, is very Southern Baptist. The black lady, Marjorie, is very Southern Baptist. And she says she has to tolerate me because she loves my daughter. <laughs> but we get along fine. I mean, we stayed at her house a couple of months ago when we went to visit her. And we attended her church with her. Mm -hmm. So she's always surprised that I don't believe in organized religion, but I'll go to her church and worship with her. As I'm worshiping to the creation, not the, cre you know, not the organized religion. So that kind of sets me apart. And some of those differences gel a lot more in me when I started dating, because I married very young with somebody that I knew at an early age. Um, mm -hmm. So we were married for 25 years when I started dating. I didn't know how to date or any of that. Right. And especially with the advent of online dating, that kind of really changes, you know, how people look at you. Mm -hmm. And I don't date people at work. And in my civilian career or my military career, I didn't date anybody I, or would never do that. So mm -hmm. that kind of limited my exposure to potential romantic partners. But I learned, you know, like there's a lot of hypocrisy in religion, a lot of hypocrisy um, in racial profiling of dates and stuff. The, the one woman once told me, she was Anglo, that she only dates men of color. I'm like, we're all colors. <laughs> uh, but so, I mean, black guys, that's all I date. I don't date anybody else. Whereas her mother was telling me, give Abraham a chance. But she to me and, she, and, and it was really funny now it wasn't when I went through it for a day or so it's like really I have a job I have a home you know I'm well well connected and all that stuff I could help you do a lot mm -hmm. of, of things yet you choose somebody that's non-productive for you but that's it is what it is so, right and I have another book coming out on that one like men are stupid <laughs> and where have all the men gone good men gone because all my women friends are always asking me where have all the good men gone Mm -hmm. And a lot, a lot of my men are saying, "Hey, I don't understand this." I'm not because we're stupid. Men are stupid. <laughs> we don't we don't get the mating game sometimes. Um, I guess, that was a big tangent. I guess on the topic, um, if you're comfortable sharing a little bit about your first marriage, as well as maybe your uh, daughters and granddaughters and um, family stuff. Yeah, it's, yeah. I came back from active duty the first time, and my children's mother mm -hmm. uh, had been married and divorced at a very young age and I didn't want to get married I wanted to have a kid mm -hmm. but not get married so I had made arrangements with the surrogate parenting association of Tennessee um, to go out and donate my material to make a baby mm -hmm. and I already signed was going to sign the papers the night I was going to go she asked me to marry her uh, we had one biological son the, the one that has the girl the daughter, granddaughters mm -hmm. and one biological daughter but in between we adopted three other young ladies uh, one was through cps the other two were neighbors or friends children that wanted to move with us or live with us so we wound up adopting them 
uh, lasted for 25 years. She was Anglo. She is Anglo. Um, but, I, you know, just to kind of share just a little bit to see why I'm divorced, she decided at a at our 25th or 20th wedding anniversary that she was gay, like her mother. Um, and so, hey, honey, I can change, but not that much. <laughs> so I wound up keeping my daughter as a single parent. I had full custody. And she stayed with me until she was 17. Mm-hmm. Um, and then I got called up to active duty several times. I stayed in the reserves most some, part of the time. Mm-hmm. But they actually brought me out of retirement twice. Mm-hmm. That's why my resume CV is kind of confusing. Right. Um, then maybe we can kind of touch on that. Um, okay. I want, firstly, firstly, it's I want to time, talk. Buddy. What's up? So it's your time. I know sometimes I go on a tangent, but no, no, no. All of your stories are amazing and I enjoy hearing them. So don't feel rushed or anything. Um, but I guess there is a lot of missing information here that would help kind of move the story. So I guess I want to ask you about your military experience, because I'm sure that's kind of linked to your immigration experience. Well, no, it's, yeah, it's kind of an interesting immigration and military experience is tied together. I was 17 years, 16 years old. My parents had come finally and they weren't used to me, you know, uh, being as um, independent as they had thought I would be, but I'd lived on my own for two years by the time they came mm-hmm. uh, here. So I had to teach them how to drive. I had to teach them all the banking and all the American things, you know, how to get a job, blah, blah, blah. So at 16, I was working at Jack in the Box over there by the Astrodome and I then decided I didn't want to be flipping hamburgers. Um, so my brother had joined the Air Force a few years before and the draft was ending for the Vietnam War. So there was no need for draft worries. But I decided to join because I wanted to be a pilot. That's a, and so I scored high enough. I had already had two years of college. So they took me, Air Force took me in and wanted me to become, you know, recruiters lied. I don't care what they say. They <laughs> said, you know, I'd be able to finish college and become a pilot, you know, if I qualified, obviously. But um, I did well enough in tech school. I was autopilot instrument technician at the time um, to where I got uh, placed in the high top secret unit reconnaissance unit and within a few months of being there they sent me to vietnam because we were doing reconnaissance support communication support mm-hmm. before all the the communication satellites were out we you know our uh, squadron was flying u2s and sr 71s to provide communication platforms so i was a technician so we were there but be, being the last ones in Vietnam, they would pull us into whatever needed to be done to where, you know, your age group doesn't think that you guys invented drones, but we had drones back then in 1974. Uh, they had them even before that. And we would fly drones from Utapau, Thailand, and go to NKP, Thailand, and fly off the drones into Laos, Cambodia. And the drones invariably would fall down or whatever, or it'll get lost, and we had to go get them. So we were in combat duty. Even though you're an aircraft technician, you're sitting there in combat going trying to pick up the drones and get the helicopters to pick it up. So it was a very interesting two years of my life. And then you'd come home. You'd be there for six to eight weeks, and you'd come home uh, to Tucson, Arizona, and then later Beal Air Force Base in California. So that was kind of um, a learning experience. And I stayed in friends with one of the guys that was there with me during those times. Um, but he and I have di- you know, divert, digress hugely in how we live and what we do. Uh, so that was the beginning of my career. And then I came out of active duty, went to school, got my degree, started working for IBM. But I stayed in the Air Force because part of the agreement for me to get out early after Vietnam was that I would p- fulfill the time in reserves. So I went working for IBM and in the reserves. and I change um, jobs every two to three years um, in the reserves and then IBM also. And as I got my degree, they moved me to Austin as an industrial engineer. So that's where the, the there's like a lot of duplication of time or it seems there's a crossover of time. But in Austin, I was in the reserve unit there plus working at IBM. And during 1986, early 87, um, I was deployed active duty to Korea. There was a young Air Force person, a military army person got killed. So 
so they, you know, they thought we were going to war, so they deployed us. It's not, you know, textbooks don't cover you, news media doesn't have, but you can find it. There was a, so we got deployed. And during that deployment under combat conditions, I was promoted to an officer mm -hmm. from being an enlisted person. So my career went from being a technician, enlisted, to an officer in leadership role. Mm -hmm. And eventually I wound up, you know, retiring as a lieutenant colonel slash colonel. Uh, managing nuclear weapons, so uh, you can see how my career progressed. But in the meantime, mm -hmm. I, I I get bored every two to three years in the Air Force, especially after my divorce. Mm -hmm. um, that was going on in 2004, 2005. Mm -hmm. I decided uh, they brought me out of retirement, assigned me to an Army unit, to where I was a combat controller, opening up airfields, uh, managing combat controllers, and different things. That some I can talk, some I can't. Get. And in 2010, I got injured. Um, so I, I came off of active duty for a while, and then they brought me back six months later at, you know, when I healed. The, the, the thing about the military, especially the category of reserve I was, is they don't have to pay you if they don't keep you active duty for 30 days. Mm -hmm. So they would give me orders for, they would deploy me for 29 days or 159 days, depending on what they needed done. And that determined their cost to me. But I had a great job on the civilian side, so I didn't care that they weren't going to give me benefits because I already had benefits from a civilian job that carried over. Like right. IBM was very good and gracious about me getting called up to active duty, like during Desert Storm, Desert Shield. There's so many different campaigns that I got called up to mm -hmm. uh, between 30 days to 40 days. Plus, I was married and had kids, so I didn't want to stay deployed. So I would take the project, so to speak. Um, to do that. So it's it's a hard one to explain, and a lot of military guys even don't understand it. Mm -hmm. There's probably about 11 of us in the country that had similar jobs. Um, and in fact, I got in a little you know, sidetrack, little argument with an Army guy who only served one year. So, dude, I served a 40-year period, 32 good years, eight of them were retired, and I retired full, mm -hmm. uh, you know, had a full retirement from the Air Force. Um, so it is what it is. Wow. Does that wow. Give, give you? Yeah, and then and on the civilian side, um, I started with IBM and repairing office equipment. They find out that I could write code, so they put me in um, in the lab in Dallas. So um, from there, they learned that I can talk and convince people and deliver. So they made me into what became IBM Professional Services, which where I managed uh, contracts for IBM at other companies like Hughes Aircraft and was the biggest contract that I had and a lot of smaller contracts. Victoria's Secrets was the best contract I had, but it wasn't anything like what people thought it would be. <laughs> wow. Uh, what are some other civilian jobs you've held or experiences that you had? Well, I had my own more, um, insurance consulting business to where a lot of independent insurance consult insurance agencies get in trouble because they don't know how to manage. So I ran a side business with that. I had a daycare that I owned and operated for a while. Um, I had a real estate business on the side where I bought and flipped homes, which is what you guys call now. Mm -hmm. But we did it, you know, we actually worked on them and let stayed with them and had deals. So those are the side jobs that I had. You know, that's one thing when I retired right about the time I was getting a divorce, I think that's why she probably left. And she, yeah, so she figured I'd be home, uh, I'd catch her doing what she wasn't supposed to do. But anyways, mm -hmm. so you know, I retired, and then the military brought me back out for three, I think thirty months. I think was the longest there, and then they brought me out again and kept me for three years, which is when I don't know if you remember. Um, you're too young. I don't know how old you are, but since you're in college, I'm, I'm assuming you're under thirty. But 25 years ago or so, um, Minot Air Force Base technicians mistakenly sent a bunch of nuclear bomb parts to Taiwan. Mm -hmm. And so they brought me out of retirement for that to fix that problem, um, to see how that happened. So, and they gave me 90 days to figure it out. I had to figure it out in a week. And so we put a stop to that. So then they kept me. Wow. The, the other one was that I called. Yeah, it's like, you know, we were buying parts from the Chinese army owned 
and putting them in nuclear weapons. So that was the other assignment that I had, which I figured out um, mm -hmm. and showed them that, you know, an FPGA, because I had one of the jobs I had was working for Dallas Semiconductor when I lived up there. Um, and I worked with chip designers and chip manufacturing. So I knew what a circuit of an FPGA, which is the field programmable gate array was, and the Chinese government was putting in um, Wi-Fi and other non-declared circuits in there and I figured it out and it was kind of interesting. It, it, the reason I can tell you is because it made the newspapers, but the people that got credit was an Israeli consulting company mm. that actually was brought in to verify that I had done it because nobody wanted to believe that I knew how a circuit would look like without actually examining it. It's like, dude, I used to design this stuff. So um, could you just to backtrack a little bit, what was your college education like? Did you complete your degree? And I know later you got a master's. So I guess I want to talk a little well, bit about your formal education. Yeah, it, you know, even though I was in college at age 14, I didn't get a degree till probably, I think it was 1984, so I was 28 um, from U of H. And it's an industrial technology degree because mm -hmm. I was married, working in the reserves. So it was the easiest one that my counselor talked me into it. And that's what got me the assignment with IBM in, in Austin. This is an industrial engineering degree. But, um, and then I have a master's of aviation from the Air Force University, um, which I never worked, even though, never used, even though before I got that degree, I had a seven month or eight month job at Northrop Grumman testing the space shuttle engines for vibration and acoustical uh, basically uh, reaction so to speak to where you know when the, the space shuttle engines started running you have tremendous amount of acoustical and vibration stress put on the engine so i did some testing on that for about six or seven months mm -hmm. and then i found out i was definitely allergic to some of the uh, chemicals we were using to attach sensors mm -hmm. um, and so I wound up going back to IBM because I'd quit IBM and to work for Northrop Grumman. Yeah. Wow, that's a long rap sheet. I, I know you mentioned. Yeah, skills. Yeah. <laughs> I know you mentioned skills in programming, um, real estate management, consulting. Um, were a lot of these skills kind of self-taught then? Yeah, it, I one of the things IBM did was they paid me to get my master's in telecommunication, which I kind of left like one semester before I was supposed to do it and switched and got a master's in health sciences, um, which you say, what the heck? But it is what it is. I just needed a master's to get promoted in the Air Force. So I picked the fastest route I could do. Um, <laughs> but um, well, because when I was injured, I was still assigned to an active duty unit. And to get promoted to colonel, I needed to have a master's degree. So I found a school that allowed me to gain it in less than a year. So that was the fastest I could do it. Wow. Uh, so, you know, then the air, military science, I should have gotten a PhD in something similar, that, but instead I went, I went into a PhD for microbiology program. And then I, I said, the heck with it, I'm done. So I, I tried to go get a law degree, uh, start law school because and it's like, nah, I'm not going to make it back to school. People are just. Yeah. Wow. So you, you've tried almost everything, huh? Yeah. If you look, you go look up the treatise on human being by Robert Heinlein, mm -hmm. what a human being should be able to do. I think that, that was my roadmap. I wanted to do everything on his list. Wow. So your philosophy was kind of experiencing as much as possible, gaining baseline proficiency in a range of skills in all sorts of fields. Yeah, that, but the, that was my driving force. But the other one was my father. When he lost everything during nationalization, all he was was a, you know, a, a shopkeeper is what he used to call himself. Mm -hmm. And he couldn't do anything, even though he had a degree and he could have taught and gotten his teaching credentials when he came here. He had a, you know, he didn't do it. He just wanted to be a shopkeeper. And I wound up supporting him for 15 years after they came here. Mm -hmm. And I never wanted to be in that position to where all I had was one skill or one, all my eggs in one basket. I see. Uh, I guess I'll probably overcompensated. <laughs> <laughs> 
Uh, I guess, was good. What was your experience like originally coming to the United States? Uh, did you come alone? Who did you come with? Um, and, you know, what was that transition like for you? Yeah, it's kind of interesting. Thank you for asking that. And I got here in December of 1969, uh, about to be the year 70. And I was 14 alone. I was supposed to be met by my brother and my two sisters. Instead, there was an Anglo woman who said she was my sister-in-law, but they were getting a divorce. I didn't know that my brother was married, that he had a wife. So she took me and took me to an empty apartment. She says, well, your brother and I used to live here, but he's joined the Air Force and he's gone. And, and I'm living in this apartment down the street. Your two sisters are about to get married. So you have about 30 days to be here. And then you're going to have to move in with one of your sisters. Um, and, you know, it turned out that the oldest sister was married and she was living in a garage apartment, so they couldn't keep me. Um, and then the middle sister was married to a devout Muslim who was willing to keep me, but I had to follow, you know, the, the Islamic rules and all that stuff, which I wasn't going to do um, at that point. So I left at age 14. Um, I've uh, I had a car that I had access to, so I bought it with some money that I had left over after coming here. Um, this and was I lived Houston? in my car for a couple. So, yeah, in Houston. Okay, okay, sorry. Um, yeah, so I didn't have um, a home basically in 30 days after coming here. My oldest sister had dropped me off in Montrose and off of Bins in a home. And at that time, Montrose was very gay, so it was very hard. To avoid. I mean, I looked like I was 14, but I looked like I was 12. Um, so one day, this uh, short order cook from Hyatt Regency Hotel downtown, and I ran into each other on the street, and she asked me what I was doing, who I was, blah, blah, blah. When I told her my story, she said, you could come live with me, and you'll be safe. I'll watch out for you. So for about nine months, I stayed in Third Ward. I don't know if you're familiar with that. It's very gentrified now, but back in the day, it was very black. Black Panthers were all over the place. So I lived with her and, you know, got a job working at Highlands Regency at age 15. I got, I uh, emancipated myself pretty much uh, through the court system, got a driver's license. So I was able to sign a lease at age 16 um, and lived on by myself until my parents came about six months later. Mm -hmm. And then I had to teach them all that stuff, you know, how to get a driver's license, how to drive how to do all this stuff. So, and then at 17, I joined the service because I just didn't want to be um, taking care of them. The, the dynamics were very different when parents expect you to be a kid and you've been on your own on the street and then on your own for three years almost. Right. Um, and, and then just one more piece. When I joined the Air Force and they put me in this top secret unit, they found out I was not a citizen. I had a green card, but I did, was not a citizen because I'd come in legally. Mm -hmm. So. They, they had because I was only 17 they had to appoint a guardian for me to go through the naturalization pro process um, so I was naturalized at age 17 about to be 18 with my shop chief as my guardian so to speak because you know the military but they wanted to keep me so they went out of their way to give me the naturalization citizenship um, so that was kind of an interesting story mm -hmm. um, then I guess what was what was this transition like? I know I noted on your survey that you speak a lot of languages. So I guess like a lot of stuff for you to be doing all of this on your own, you would have to be pretty proficient in English and kind of, you know, culturally perceptive. So what was that like when you first got here? Did you have any Yeah, that's that's a great question. Uh, Lisa Zeiler is the name that comes to mind. I wish I could find her. Um I had no idea how to get a job, but I would see help wanted signs, right? I, culturally, I didn't know. Even though I spoke the Queen's English, American English is very different. Um, I spoke British English um, because of the schooling and stuff. So um, I went to apply for a job, and Lisa was the secretary. She was the same age, 16, 17. Her mother owned a um, headhunting company. So she got me a job as a mortgage company clerk. I don't know how they pulled it off. I was 15 years old running a mortgage a messaging service for a mortgage <laughs> company. Mm -hmm. So that was a great, you know, I got really lucky and, and, you know, like running into Willie 
a black woman, short order cook, no education, but she provided me some stability and protection. So I've been lucky at each step of the way. People ask me, like when I adopted Jesse six years ago as a single parent, they're like, what the heck are you doing? I'm like, I'm just paying back Willie. You know, I'm paying it forward to where all my life I've been very lucky that no matter what happened, there was somebody, a guardian angel or whatever you want to call it, um, a guide shows up. And I'm very much into, you know, you asked me earlier about culture and ethnicity. If I was to claim one, which I don't have any blood, but I would claim the First Nation um, Native Americans and Hopi being the, the tribe I know the best and Chickasha uh, secondarily, um, is they have a concept of gui guides that show up in your life to kind of walk you through the thing. And I've been very lucky, even at age 67, I've always had, you know, I can say even last uh, three years ago, when I had open heart surgery, um, that, you know, if you look at a heart surgeon, you think he was homeless, but he'd perform miracle replacing a heart valve for me. And I had people that I thought were just acquaintances stepped in to take care of Jessie because I had just adopted her. She's two years into my life at that point. Uh, and so there's always, I've been lucky, you know, and, and one of them was a Syrian who grew up in Ireland and married an Irish woman. So he was kind of, he gets it, right? And then yeah. the other one was a, a, a guy that I had mentored um, was um, from India and he's married to an Anglo and he and Hassan took care of Jesse because Jesse was kind of just lost. You know, here she got adopted and the man is going through open heart surgery. So they, they took really good care of her. So people step into my life. And, you know, I was talking to the monks yesterday about karma. And th the definition of karma is very different to a Tibetan than it is to a Hindu. Yeah, and they live in India. So he was trying to explain, I said, no, no, I get it. That's like, it's your action and reaction and causation to an action that comes through, not the, you know, the westernized definition of karma. So we had an interesting talk and nobody had shown up. They were supposed to give a audience of 50, 60 people how to do, you know, their Mandela and how they were making a Mandela. And that was just Jesse and I were the only ones there. And then my friend Stephen came in later. So I think I've been very lucky. Um, you know, it's like when I got divorced, it was the worst time of my life pretty much. But one of my mentors in the military called me up and said, hey, I'm going to activate you and send you to Africa to do some stuff. And that was the best, you know, it was very dangerous health wise to me. I got injured, but it was a great experience. I learned a lot. I met a lot of new friends and went totally different direction in how, you know, I look at my career. So it is what it is. Yeah. I mean, it seems like you have a very open outlook on, you know, philosophy of living um how how do you think you try to perpetuate this philosophy in your parenting and how you pass it on to not just your children your grandchildren but the people around you the thing that i find interesting is i'm sad that my children are made into pawns with my ex-wife she is no longer gay she married a white very insecure person uh, he doesn't work she stays home so he perpetuates a lot of negative feelings and negative opinions about me but the way i perpetuate is is go talk to people um whole you know i pick up a lot of uh, mentees in meetups i don't know if you're familiar with meetups um mm -hmm. and and like we were at the Bay city arts festival jesse had her mentee she's mentoring a young woman from afghanistan because i've been teaching her you know you asked about perpetuating how I feel and she's taken on that role because you know I kind of you know as an adoptee she, I had to mentor her from and deprogram her for all the things she had learned so she's trying to help another person and I hope that's what perpetuates uh, you know paying it forward mm -hmm. um, one of the things that I find that's negative about me is I'm an empath I can feel um, any emotion that, uh, or thoughts you know, not detail i don't know what you're thinking what a person's thinking but i can feel a lot like when i met jesse i knew she was in trouble with her biological family so i offered her say hey if you need a parent you're welcome to, to call me papa and eventually i wound up legally adopting her so i just live my life i mean Taoism, i guess and native american is just do what you think is correct 
you know, live in harmony with nature as much as you can. And living that life, I'm just happy with who I am. You know, they they asked me when I got, uh, after I woke up from my open heart surgery, I said, how are you going to change your life? And I said, well, this is not the first time I have died. I died when I got shot and I came out of that, but this one was the plan. You know, I knew I was going to get done, but I don't really have any regrets how I've lived. Yeah, I've made mistakes and I've done some things, but I can look at myself and say, I've done the right thing. I have three core values, which most people can't tell you. And unfortunately, unfortunately, they're the same that the Air Force has, which is service before self means help others, respect for everybody and everything, and then integrity in everything that I do. And that has led me to not be upset with life. I get upset with people, but I'm not upset with myself or the universe long answer i hope that makes sense no i i I think you phrased it really nicely um and i think you shared a lot of lessons that are important for people especially in my generation to be able to process and reflect upon i I think so i think you know your generation i'm assuming you're about 26 25 i'm 21 oh wow you're just a baby okay (laughs) So especially your generation with social media and the technology, you know, I felt bad because technology wasn't working because I I usually like Google Meet or I use WebEx Mm -hmm. because that always works. WebEx especially always works. I'm very technology aware and having white hair and being 67, even though I don't look it, you know, they see the white hair and they kind of either are very, especially the Asians are very respectful, obviously, because you're brought up that way. But most Americans think you're stupid. Yeah. Not that you're not American, but you grew up in a different culture than the average white person. Or, or uh, So that's the harder thing is you guys don't have, um, I hate to use the word hero, but you don't have role models in, in life. You know, you look at political people, they're all sleazeballs. You look at the entertainment people, you look at influencers. And, you know, one of the reasons I like hanging out at Rice Campus, because you do have some people, I hang out at the physics department a lot, and I attend a lot of their lectures. And I attend a lot of lectures with the religion and philosophy group people. Mm -hmm. And it's kind of interesting to share what you just asked, is your generation had never heard of Pascal's wager. Um, I don't know if you have, I mean, you're you're in a different uh, discipline, but if you were in religion, uh, discipline, I would expect you to know. Pascal's wager is when, pa- I mean, boil it down, he says, it's okay if I, I live a good life, ethical life, and go to church. If there's a God, I'm okay. If there's no God, I'm I'm still okay. And I call Abraham's wager, it's like, just live a normal life, regardless of whether <laughs> there's God or not. And the young kids there didn't understand that. It's like, you know, I'm not saying don't believe in God. I don't, I'm not saying don't believe in religion. But have your compass, your core values that you live by. And that's, you know, if there is a God, I, I know I'm going to argue with her or, uh, you know, it's a joke. But, you know, whatever deity that is, I'm willing to argue and say, hey, I lived an ethical, moral life. And I gave the three lessons that we're supposed to live by. Yeah. yeah. Wow. And to me, those are easier to remember than the Ten Commandments. You know, if you look, uh, you know, Taoism or Confucianism. Or even Buddhism, Buddhism especially gets really detailed in you know eight empowerment rules and eight eight this or eight seven this or whatever. It's like to me, if you live ethically, you're not going to steal, you're not going to lie, blah blah blah. If you live morally, you're not going to cheat on your neighbor's wife, blah blah blah, right? And then if you live service before self, it's it takes care of it, the Ten Commandments. So to me, that's even simpler. Yeah. To teach, to teach you guys or expose you to it. You know, like the gentleman that was, wrote me earlier, he was asking me, it's, oh, you advised me to do this. Like, I didn't advise you anything. I just gave you information. Mm-hmm. And that's how I try to live, is just give information. So, sometimes I'm successful, sometimes I'm not. Yeah, very wise. Um, yeah. I guess then... Kind of moving away from these bigger things that what are some like what now 
um, you're retired. Seems like you are settled. Um, what are some things you hope to accomplish um, with your time now? And do you have any like bucket list items that like maybe don't have to be so deep, but just fun? Um, okay. Well, I mean, part of it is is you know encoding your generation and even younger with some value systems that you can live by, right? So I have a blog that I call JustStreetSense.com. It kind of, when I was sick, um, it kind of went out and somebody encrypted it. So I'm having to relaunch it. And I do a lot of podcasts on critical thinking and subjects with a buddy of mine who's an attorney, Stephen. And Jesse talks about from her perspective, her age group. And always trying to recruit people younger to come in and talk or different backgrounds to talk. So that's kind of my legacy. And so this kind of your interview just fits into that is somebody else taping me, somebody else asking me questions. Mm -hmm. um, so that's one aspect of it. The other one is mentoring people. There's a lot of kids here, your age group there with H1B visa or um, F1 visas or whatever that don't have families that don't have some place to turn to. So we keep the house open for anybody that you know needs a guide, even if it's just for one time, not ongoing. So that's the other topic that I do. The other thing is I call myself a street preacher to the philosophies that I have, I think are very positive and easy to work with. So I'm, I attend a lot of meetings and I talk, um, you know, so money wise with my retirement um, pensions, from the Air Force, the, the railroad that I worked, which we didn't really talk about, but I was on the railroad for a couple of years, and IBM and a few other places it provide me to where I'm financially worry-free, um, and I live very frugally uh, and minimally, so that allows me a lot of freedom, uh, not wanting, not having, you know, not to go too deep, but not having the desire to drive a Mercedes or live in you know expensive home area or drive an expensive car frees me up um jesse and i just came from a 5,000 mile trip where i took her through the east coast and met a lot of my friends who were in the military with me and she got to see my extended family so to speak mm -hmm. and none of these people are biologically related to me but they you know we stayed at their houses we stayed with them um and it was just like going home to family that we chose each other right so that's the other part is when I go to churches and talk to people then formally or synagogues or whatever, I'm trying to let them see that, you know, you don't have to worry about the afterlife rewards or whatever. Um, you just need to be rewarded now with experience. Like to me, to see Marjorie after six years, I hadn't seen her in six years. It was phenomenal. You know, she's my sister. Mm -hmm. And they were all like, what this white boy doing over here with this Hispanic girl in a black church? Like, he's my brother. <laughs> Just her saying that was phenomenal. So mm -hmm. that's my job, basically, is the next 10, 15 years or however long that I live is to get that message out to people and to say, hey, you know, it is simple. It is that simple. Yeah, that's beautiful. Um, I think, obviously, I had a million questions for you, but after this whole dialogue, I think I really am satisfied with a lot of the things that you've shared. Um, and I don't think I have any specific questions right now that I want to open up, but is there- I have one. Yeah. Yeah, I have one. You know, because it's a culturally associated uh, project, so to speak. And one of the things I run into all the time is when I say I'm Asian, People kind of look at me because Asian means Chinese to most people, right? Mm -hmm. And how would you reconcile me into your project to say he's Asian? I think you define yourself. And I think you believe, I think, I believe you said you were multi-ethnic. Um, and I don't think it's up to me or anybody else to determine that identity for you. And maybe by blood or maybe by choice, you do align with some Asian values or you see yourself connected to the Asian community somehow. And okay. I think that's more than okay. enough to be a part of this archive. Okay, cool. I appreciate that because, yeah, blood wise, you know, genetic wise, I am Asian, even though Middle East is considered African by some, it's still Asia. But my mother's side um, and my father's side, I'm definitely Asian with Southeast Asian and Chinese DNA in it. 
So even though I don't put it on paper as such, uh, you know, I'm hoping in the archives that someday my granddaughters will go looking for somebody with their last name and they see me talking. Um, I think that's my goal. And hopefully yeah. if I impart anything to anybody else listening in or is looking at and say, hey, well, who the heck is this guy? Uh, yeah. But yeah, I subscribe to Taoism probably as the the guiding light. And then Chi, I know when you when you guys interviewed him, he has a very simple thing that he says is like one, two, three. Um, he says Taoism is about self and improving self. Confucianism is about the community and helping the community. And Buddhism comes in and puts in some um, um, philosophies into everyday living. Mm -hmm. um, so that's that to me makes me more Asian than anybody because I <laughs> and when you put in, you know, having been brought up by a Buddhist monk living next to a pagoda in Burma for nine years of my life. So it's like, okay, if I have to geographically define who I am or where, I, where my values are, they're Asian. Yeah. And Jessie will tell you that she she gets bugged because I become an Asian parent and push her to do good in school, whereas the Hispanic people don't do that. <laughs> so mm -hmm. that was a big change for her to see a parent sitting there, push, push, push to go, hey, degree time, great time. Yeah. You know, study time. I think um just like our archive has a spectrum of different people we have people who are very in, ingrained in asian culture uh in their specific ethnicities and they subscribe strongly to their traditions and heritage and so forth and i think there are people who don't adhere so strictly people who are a lot whose identities aren't so dependent upon their identity. i believe there's a place for everyone in this archive and i believe you um have a place in here as well so Okay, and so last question is, where will this archive be available? Was it through the Rice University or a different the society? The... It is under the Rice University, I believe, but um, it's, okay. own, it's its own entity. So it has its own website and publicly available interviews and transcripts. And I'm happy to send that in a follow-up email for you if you're interested in kind of exploring. Yeah, this that'd be great. So I can pass it on and post it on, on my yeah. website. Yeah, yeah, of course. Um, I guess then just okay, to Sam, great job. Yeah, go ahead. Um, I, I just have a last question. I'm always supposed to ask every interview. Um, sure. if there's anything in this interview that you would have wanted to cover, but we haven't touched upon. Is there anything now, or are you happy just kind of wrapping up? No, you, you did great, and you allowed me to say some things that are tangential to do that. And like I said, like my CV, I've omitted a lot of different things. Um, but I think I got the message out that I wanted to get out. So I thank you for being patient to let me finish and do that at, at your young age and your discipline of neurobiology that speaks highly of you. Um, and uh, hopefully someday I can meet you for coffee or something at the Rice University because we're there quite a bit at different lectures at the Commons. I guess it's, I call it the Commons, but the coffee shop there. Right. Yeah, of course. I love that. Um, well, actually. If it's okay, I'll end the recording right here, but uh, I won't okay. I won't quit the Zoom or anything.